Hi, this is Ivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Taylor Jenkins Reid is the New York Times bestselling author of Malibu Rising, Daisy Jones and the Six, The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, and other novels. She currently lives in Los Angeles with her husband and their daughter. Welcome, Taylor. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Malibu Rising. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited. So funny. I stayed up. I had read most of this a couple of weeks ago. It kept me company the day that my kids went to my ex-husband's and I was like so sad. And all I wanted to do was like get into bed and read something good. And I picked this up. I was like, everybody's raving about this book. And I had this interview coming up and it totally like did the trick. So I just want to know you like kept me company in like a very dark moment of the summer. So I am I am honored to have had the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then I finished it last night and it kept me up until like, you know, I don't know, one thirty in the morning, which I never do because I read like eight books a week or something crazy. And I am very good with my time. And anyway, I was like, I cannot skim a word. Like I want every word of this book. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> my husband yeah. was like, that's the book of the summer. You know, I, I'm like, I know I've been having I've had it everywhere we've gone. So anyway, that's my personal story about it. Okay. For people who don't know what Malibu Rising is about, would you mind telling a little bit about it and also how you came up with this, especially after Daisy Jones and the Six? Yeah. So Malibu Rising is the story of the Riva family. They are four adult siblings, surfers, throwing a party at the end of August in 1983 in, in Malibu. And the book starts at 7 a.m. and takes you hour by hour through a day in the life of this family going back in time to their parents' marriage to show you all the long simmering tensions in this family. And then as the party starts, some of these tensions rise to the surface. And by the end of the night, everything has turned into complete chaos. So Malibu Rising <laughs> is, is the story of that day. And I, I came to write it in a couple of different ways. I had a few different ideas of things that I wanted to write about. And I had a moment where I realized that all of these things could come together and sort of coalesce into one novel. And and so the elements were, I really wanted to write about siblings. I wanted to write about kids who have sort of had to raise themselves and how they bonded together how they banded together and bonded, I should say, through this sort of, you know, trauma of having to, of of losing both of their parents in different ways. And then I also wanted to write about famous children because I've been writing about fame for a while. And one of the things that I was interested in is, you know, two of my previous characters, Evelyn Hugo and Daisy Jones, are women that know what they want. And they're very serious about going after it, albeit in different ways. And what they want is the attention of the world. And I thought, well, what is it like when you have the attention of the world, but you didn't seek it out and you don't necessarily want it? It was It's something that was chosen for you. And so those pieces came together for me. And I thought, well, what if it wasn't just, what if it was a famous father that left you? How would that be different than the experience of never seeing your father again. What, what if you see him on billboards and you hear his music on the radio, but know that he's not there for you? What would that feel like? And so I, that's when I knew I was like, well, I already have a famous character. I have a character who is famous who would leave his kids. <laughs> and that's Mick Reva. I had written about Mick Reva and the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo, and he appears again in Daisy Jones very briefly. And I thought, well, there you go. I mean, there's your answer. That's the guy, that's the guy who would, who would leave his kids. And then it was like, okay, well, if it's Mick Reva, then, you know, that brings us into, he probably had kids around this time. And now we're into the eighties, which I had wanted to write about. And I really wanted to write about the beach. And so all of it came together and I thought, let's just set 
a rager in Malibu in 1983 and let Mick Reeves' children, you know, get through all of their their tension and agita in one night. Wow. That's so interesting that that's how it came about. I love that. And also what you said about, you know, raising kids, raising themselves, essentially. I mean, I feel like Nina, your character, Nina, is just so, I mean, they're all so real, but I feel like the issues that she's struggling with and how we watch her over time sort of come to terms with that and how you have that arc of her characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing. It's really, and You know, I feel like the positioning of the book is like it's a rager in Malibu. Yes, yes, of course, obviously. But it's like there's so much, it's so much deeper. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I I do, I, I, look, I try very hard to make my books really fun. And and so I appreciate when people think they're fun, but I also work really hard to make sure that they are saying something and that they have complexity to them and that there's something to sink your teeth into. And so thank you for seeing that. No, of course. I mean, some of these issues, particularly, I feel so attached to Nina's mom, June. I feel like you can't, you, like, I want her to come back. I don't know if you're going to do anything, not that she can, well, anyway, just that they were so lifelike and they each had something that they kind of taught the reader in the end. I don't know. So when you're coming up with your characters, Mm -hmm. fiction to me, I'm just so impressed by novelists and the ability to, you know, craft people out of thin air and make them just so realistic. And especially these ones who I could literally see, like, I can't wait for the movie, but I feel like I just watched it in my head already. And it was like you know, 12 hours long and I loved it and it was great. So, you know, <laughs> I'll have to compete with that, my own footage. But when you're creating your characters, like, what is your secret? Like, how is it? You, how do you do it? Is it, I was trying to analyze it as I read, is it the details? Is it the backstory? And when you learn the backstory, is it the details, like little things? Is it the big, like, what is it the, in how you see them when they interact with other people that gives away the most? Cause I feel like that always shows us so much. I don't know. Sure. How- yeah. I, I, you know, the, the most succinct answer to your question is, I don't know. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think what it is for me is that certainly lately I spend a lot of time doing research on my novels at the very beginning of my process. And and during that period of time, I'm not writing, but I'm thinking constantly, you know, you come across a fact, oh, would my character do that or not do that? And by the end of that period of time, I know them. I really feel like they live somewhere in my head. I know them and I know what they would do and what they wouldn't do. And so by the time I get to writing, it's funny. I think sometimes there are two different types of writers. And I mean, I've totally made up this theory and I have no evidence to back it up. But but (laughs) I, I think sometimes there are people who they think a sentence and then they think that's a good sentence and then they type it. And for me that whole process is not happening. I don't know what I'm about to type before I type it. It's going like directly from like my reptilian brain into my fingers and it's like totally bypassing my frontal lobe. And so there are times when something will reveal itself as I'm typing and I'll go, oh, okay, I didn't know that I knew this about them. I think it's just an innate sense that I have for who these people are, they show up pretty fully formed for me. And I try to just get as close to the truth of them as I can on the page. And so I really appreciate you saying that, that they come to life for you because they're, they are, they come to life for me very, very much. June in particular, I know her, I feel her. I, and then, and then in turn, you know, it's, I pretty much know the things that, that the large things that are going to happen in a novel, but there are times when I, by somebody else, you know, my husband, who's my first reader, my agent, my editor, I have to be pushed to make some of the really terrible things happen because I've come to love them so much. And it's hard for me. I've cried multiple times in like notes meetings, not because I was bothered by the note, but because I was like, Oh no, you're right about this note. And now I have to go do this sad thing to this person that I care about. So they're very real to me. And I hope that means they're real on the page. Wow. You had this interesting line. I also love the character Kit. I mean, I loved all your characters, honestly. But as she's sort of struggling and as she puts on 
the outfit and decides on, you know, who she wants to be for that party. You wrote, dressed as she was, she could feel a difference in how the rooms she entered made space for her. She was still trying to figure out how she felt about it. And I just love that line. Well, tell me, tell me about that line. I just loved it. Yeah. Well, what I think is really interesting about when we're meeting Kit in this particular time in her life is that she is curious about finding out more about herself. And so she's changing things up. She's going to dress a little bit differently. She's going to try to behave a little bit differently. And the way that she's choosing to dress and behave is a little bit more conventional, more traditional. It's a more, we'll say it's, it's a, it's a stricter definition of femininity that she's going to show a little skin and she's going to be conventionally attractive and she's going to do that. And look, I have had, Gender presentation is a really interesting thing to me. I've, I, my whole life, I was, there was always a subtext to a lot of my conversations with people where it felt like I wasn't being feminine enough. The way that I was speaking wasn't particularly feminine. The way I was dressing wasn't particularly feminine. And it bothered people. And I <laughs> sort of felt like, well, I mean, I was very influenced by bothering people. I don't want to bother people. And so it was like, okay, why? Well, let me try this on. Okay, this works but I don't, I still don't know if it's me. And over time, you know, I'm in my thirties now and I've adapt, I've been able to adopt a much stronger sense of self and a feeling of like, Oh, I can be whatever I want any particular day. And so I'll be this one day and something else another day. But when you're a teenager or somebody like Kit, who's, who's, you know, 2021, she's trying on a new self and she's certainly getting attention for it, but is it who she is? She's not sure. And so Kit is someone I just have a lot of affection for. She's, she's, working through some pretty big questions that night. And I don't even think she knows what she's setting into motion when she does it. So true. I feel like this whole thing though of fame and coming into room and how you're perceived by others, that's really what the whole thing is almost about in a way too. Yeah. The differences between how you see yourself and how they're all thinking of you. And and what people want you to be, you know? I mean, ne- people want Nina to be something other than what she is. And people want Kit to be something other than what she is. And I think, you know, look, it's, it's the way all of us function through life is societal expectations versus what's in our heart, right? But, but for women, we're just given a lot less leeway on societal mm-hmm. expectations. And... So I find their struggle between what they they're being asked to perform or what they need to perform in order to get what they want versus what they want to do on their own, what their heart is telling them to do. Both of them find more concrete answers to those questions than I think they intend to. And how do you feel about, I mean, Daisy Jones was such a huge hit, right? And now, of course, this is another huge hit. And so I'm sure you're grappling with these issues of fame yourself as you're writing them in your characters. Like, how are you thinking about that for you? Like, are you enjoying this? Is it, I mean, in a way when you're writing, you want it, but do you want this? I mean, yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. And it's funny because it's a, it's a question that I've been presented with a few times over the course of, of releasing this book. And my answer keeps changing. And I think part of that is because of the, I mean, my initial instinct in being asked that question every single time is to, is to bat it away as quickly as possible and to say, I'm not famous. There's nothing famous about me. I'm an author. I'm just writing stories. Nobody needs to be interested in me, but, but it does at some point get a little naive and insincere, right? Like I, I have the ability to get my story to a much wider audience than I certainly was at the beginning of my career. And that, most people have the opportunity to do and and to deny that is, is a little bit silly, but at the same time, I really do grapple with, I am, I am not well suited to performance. And so when you're not well suited to it, what does the performance look like? Because everything is a performance, right? Like, I mean, even your day-to-day life and your interactions with the person on the street and you know, we, we live two lives, we live our inner life and then we live the life that we show people with Instagram, with, you know, it's as simple as, you know, in the United States, somebody says, oh, how are you? And you go, good, good. How are you? And it's like, it's totally irrelevant to how your day's actually going, right? We're just putting on the performance. Oh, my day's going well. How's your day going? So I'm not, I'm not well suited to the performance piece. And I don't have an answer yet on how I feel about it. There's definitely growing pains. It's definitely hard for me to understand. You know, I, I released a thing on my Instagram. If anyone wants signed copies, 
called Diesel Bookstore here in LA and uh, I'll go over and sign them for you. And I thought, you know, I, I, I honestly thought like maybe 30 people would call and uh, it just turned out to be much, much bigger. And that's hard for me to understand. I still don't <laughs> totally understand it. So I'm grappling with it. How, how many, how many people? I think we up? had about 500 in the first two weeks and, and wow. it's a lovely, lovely thing to have happen. But I just, I, it's an adjustment for me. I mean, look, my first book came out, nobody, you know, I had a very small, loyal fan base that was mostly the copies my mother-in-law bought, you know? And, <laughs> and so, so I know that not every book gets that kind of attention. And so I'm appreciative for it every single time, every reader that shows up, buys a book, reads it at the library. I know not every author gets that. So I am very, very appreciative. And I didn't mean to ask you now. I feel ridiculous. Like, I'm sorry to ask you questions you get all the time. No, I'm sorry. No, that's, that is not at all what I meant. What I, what I meant is that it, it lent, my work lends itself to that question. And, and I wish that I had a more concrete answer, but it's, I think your, I think your answer is how you feel and that's okay. I mean, not everything is totally crystallized while you're going through it. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's well put. Yeah. I think, I think you're getting me in the middle of I'm, I'm in the chrysalis right now. And I, and I'm like trying to report on how it looks in here, you know, is, yeah. is sort of, I don't know. I don't know how I will change, but I can yeah. tell that I will. So back to your being the reader for your, your husband being your first reader. Mm-hmm. So do you read it out loud to him or do you, does he read it himself? Oh no, he reads all, he's the first person that reads, I mean, everything I write. He's a writer too. He's a screenwriter. And so he reads everything that I write. And I have learned, you know, I'm, I am, I just finished my eighth book. I have learned not to sit over him or be in the same room when he is reading my, because it used to be like, like I'd see him like smile or shake his head and be like, what line are you at? What, what are you reacting to? <laughs> and now I just hand it over to him and I'm like, okay, I need this by Monday. And, and, you know, and, and let him do his thing. And he's phenomenal at story. It really incredible at structure. And so I benefit greatly from both his encouragement and his hard truths. He's come to me a few times over the years. And I remember with one book in particular, he, he was like, it's not, uh, it's not good enough. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll try again. You know, cause he, oh, wow. he, you know, he, he shows up for me in the way that a true, true partner does, which is to say that like, he's not going to lie to me. And and he's going to tell me the hard truth when I need to hear it. And so I trust everything that he says. And do you do the same for his work? I do. Although he needs me less. <laughs> he he <laughs> breaks a lot of stories. I, I work on basically one book over the course of a year, most likely two years. So he'll read the same book like two or three times. My husband's breaking screenplays like, I mean, he probably does like 10 stories a year. And so sometimes... He'll, he'll bring me in when he needs like character work and, and, or like he has a final draft of something. But I think over the years, he needs me less now than I need him. So he's got the power in this relationship on that front. <laughs> nice. Are you ever going to, are you going to collaborate? Aren't, don't, we you, have. There, yeah. Yeah. yeah we, okay. We've written some screenplays together. We adapted my book, One True Loves. We're in the process of actually working on a new draft of that because it's scheduled to shoot next month. So yeah, it's, it's fun to, to work with him. He's just very talented and I'm in, I'm in good hands and only have to do half the work that way. (laughs) And you were so nice to, you know, thank him and everybody for taking care of your daughter. I get that. So sweet. No, I, I, it's hard getting stuff done. It's like really hard. (laughs) It's, it's hard getting stuff done. And once I had a kid, I just realized the amount of labor that is, required in order to raise a child the way you have to rearrange your entire life around it. And I want to be very clear with people because they may see on Instagram, it's like, Oh, me and my, you know, I'm talking about my cute little kid and here are the books that I'm writing. And I know for me, I look at other moms and I'm like, how are you doing that? Like, I don't have time to do everything you're doing. How are you doing it? And I just want to be really clear. Like I'm doing it with help. You know, I, I have a husband who, you know, actively raises his daughter is with her, you know, 50%, if not more of the time I have, you know, obviously 
now back to having a school system that that helps. I have in-laws that watch her. I have, you know, people, I have nannies and babysitter, you know, I have help. And I think that's important. I, I, I personally want to be transparent about that. Yeah. I couldn't do anything I do. I mean, right now I have like seven kids in the other room behind that door. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. <laughs> but I also have my in-laws and a babysitter and my husband and, yeah. you know, I hear the screams yeah. and I know I can do this interview. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it takes a village and we can't do yeah. it. I mean, there are people that are doing it on their own and I know, I know. Give I, I have so much respect. All, um, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I, I have so much respect for the people. My mom did it on her own for a long time. And, and, you know, I just have, a, I have a lot of respect for it. And I also want to be transparent about the support that I do have. Cause I think sometimes we make it invisible. And then when we look at it, from, you know, on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, you know, it's like, how, how are they managing to do all of that in one day? And how did she bake that cake? I'm so tired, you know? Yeah. So uh, that's my, my soapbox that I will get on for me personally is, is just wanting to talk more about that. Interesting. I hope now I'm like rethinking my Instagram. I don't think it, I make it seem like I don't have help. I doubt that you do, but also I don't put like my family members on my Instagram. So it's like, I'm not sitting here going like, Oh, here's the nanny. Oh, here's my babysitter. And like showing a photo of them. It's more just like when you have an opportunity to talk about how you get work done or who to thank, you know, for me, it's like, let me, let me thank the people that, that make the room for me to do this. Yeah. Of course I'm now like, you know, you say something about you and I'm like, Oh, does that mean I'm doing something wrong? It has nothing to do with me. I'm so sorry. (laughs) That's exactly. But no, I, no, but I, I do the exact same thing. That's what I mean. Like when I look at women's Instagrams or I look at even, you know, parenthood is not just a female thing, but mothers are, are just super highly charged this idea of motherhood and how to be a good mother. And we, and our society defines women by it so much that uh, I'm very receptive to like, I'll, I'll be on Instagram and I'll be like, well, her entire spice rack is all fresh spices and mine is not. And how did she do that? You know, like I just get, I, I'm very susceptible to like somebody's just doing their own thing, but I'm thinking about how it reflects on me. I mean, we all are. Okay. You have to check out my Instagram and tell me if I'm coming across as like, you know, <laughs> as trying to do it all and like I, something like that. I'm just, I assure you, I am not judging anybody else. I, I, I'm judging myself so much. I have no time to judge anyone else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, I feel that way too. And everybody's like posting all the workout classes and the like, oh, yeah. know, everybody's so fit. And I'm anyway, I'm just like, okay, well, you know what? I got a lot of other stuff done today. So that's, <laughs> exactly. that's what I have to offer. Exactly. You know? So yeah. Anyway, so your, your most recent book, what, what is that about? The one you just finished? Well, I, you know, mom's the word. I just, I just finished it. I don't know when it's going to come out. It is basically, I see the seven husbands of Evelyn Hugo, Daisy Jones and the six. Malibu Rising and this next one as sort of a quartet that there are four books about women in the public eye during various decades and different sort of scenes in American culture in the uh, second half of the 20th century. And so, you know, I've given some clues here and there about, you know, a little bit of what it will be about. The biggest thing I've said is just that it will take place in the nineties. We've had Evelyn Hugo in the sixties, Daisy Jones in the seventies, Mal in the eighties. And now we're going to go to the nineties. And then once, you know, and I have, I, you know, I have a few more rounds of stuff to do on that copy edits and things like that. But once that book is, is sealed, I'm going to start fresh again. I'm going to go in a different direction and I have some ideas of what that will be. I'm not totally sure yet, but I want to, go back to the drawing board and, and come up with an area of the world that I have more to say about. I love that. And do you do all your work at home or do you usually like to work? Yeah. I like to work at home. I need silence. I really need, I need it to be quiet. And also I'm old now. And so I have like carpal tunnel, you know, and I need like my mouse and my keyboard. Otherwise my wrist starts aching, you know, I have the same thing. I'm pretending it's not carpal tunnel, but it gets like all swollen in here. Is that what happens to you? Yeah. Mine just aches. Like my wrist aches. Yeah. Yeah. And, and my shoulder, Yeah, (laughs) it's just a bad, it's a bad setup. But so I'm at home at my desk working and it gives me a strong sense of, you know, this is, I feel very centered here at my desk and, and I can focus. Now, when my kid is home, 
because she's been pulled out of school for COVID or something, then it's very difficult to get any work done. But I still stay here and just put in some white noise headphones and keep going. Awesome. Do you have any advice for aspiring authors? I do. Write more. I think I, at the beginning of my career, was not reading or writing as much as I later ended up doing. And the more that I wrote, the better I got. I think if you just write and write and write, if you just write one thing from beginning to end, if you have a short story idea, you have a novel idea, you have an essay you want to write, just finish it. The joy of finishing it will be enough, I think, to power you through to the next one. There's that sense of satisfaction when you just finish something. And I think the more you write, the better you get. And the more you read, the more aware you are of, you know, your, your place in the, in the larger world that you're writing about. I love that. That's great. Taylor, thank you so much. This has been so fun. I can't wait for your next installment of the quartet. Thank and you. Yeah. Thank you for, so much. This has been so fun. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, have a great day. All right, thank okay. you. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 